tonight, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to our Zoom meetup. Uh, my name is Kurt Davis. I'm one of the founders of Real Estate Wealth Coaching. Jack Simon, my partner, he is also on the call as well. He's the other founder. And we have a great presentation put together tonight. I hope that everybody will find some type of value out of it. Uh, but again, we are Real Estate Wealth Coaching, and we're going to get started here. First off, we'd like to say, if you're not following us, uh, you really should be. We put out a lot of great content on our Facebook page at Real Estate Wealth Coaching, Instagram, and Meetup. So Meetup is the platform where we where we promote all of our upcoming monthly meetups. We do cross post that through Facebook and other outlets as well. But uh, Facebook, Meetup, Instagram, connect with us there. Make sure you're following us, like us. Also, we put out a ton of great, great content on our YouTube page. So if you go to youtube.com backslash real estate wealth coaching, if you find this page, you're in the right spot. Uh, we do a lot of teaching tips. Uh, we do interviews. Uh, we also do video of actual projects that are going on. And they're not just my projects. Uh, if we have students who are doing projects, we go out and we see what they're doing and we film and record them and we want to learn what they're doing. So uh, this is just another great resource for you to have uh, in terms of everything real estate investing. So make sure you're following us, subscribe, and make sure you click that little ping button so that whenever we post new videos, you're alerted. All right. <clears throat> Our sponsor for tonight's meetup is Avalon Capital. And Avalon Capital is a private lending entity that makes loans to investors that is strictly asset-based. So uh, here's some general information about Avalon Capital. Uh, when, they, when they approve a loan, they charge five points loan origination, 1% a month interest only payments. These are typically six month or less terms, but if it's a loan that needs to go longer, they will do a renewal for two points. There are no prepayment penalties and no credit is pulled. Like I said, this is an asset-based loan. It is based strictly on the property. Uh, and then depending on the quality of the property, they will usually lend in the 70 to 80% range. Uh, if you want to follow Avalon Capital on Facebook, you can. Avalon Capital LLC. If you are ever in need of private lending and you're looking for a private lender, all you have to do is go to realestatewealthcoaching.com backslash private lending, and there is a very basic, I don't really want to call it an application, but it's more of a questionnaire, fill out the form with uh, the, the details of the property you have, because then we take that and analyze it and pass it on to Avalon Capital, who will then get in touch with you. Because right now, Avalon Capital does not have a website. Everything is strictly word of mouth. So... Uh, they are our sponsor tonight. They make loans. I, I get loans through them. They make loans to a lot of our, our students who are in our program. Uh, so a very, very no hassle form of private lending. Now, if anybody who's on a call tonight is in the local Memphis area, North Mississippi, I'm looking to buy houses and I'm buying all over the city. Uh, it's a seller's market right now and investors are just snatching everything up. So I can pay cash, close fast. Here's kind of a list of all the zip codes and areas that I want to be in throughout Memphis. Uh, in terms of North Mississippi, I'm primarily looking in the Horn Lake, South Haven, Olive Branch area. Criteria is typically three bed, one bath or better. There are a couple zip codes where I will consider two bedrooms. Uh, if you do have anything like this, or if you're looking to build, you know, here's a, here's a, if you're wholesaling in the Memphis area and you're looking for a cash buyer, there's my contact information. Make sure I'm on your list for when you do get property. <clears throat> now in October, uh, we have Amy Ransdell, who is going to be our guest speaker. And Amy is actually located out of the Atlanta, Georgia market. And she has a ton of things going on down there. She is absolutely crushing it in the Atlanta market. She's a realtor broker. She's flipping houses. She's teaching investment classes, teaching people how to flip houses, invest. Uh, she used to be a former fortune builders coach. So she is crushing it and she is going to be our special guest speaker in October. Now, 
I do not have these posted to our meetup page yet. I will probably have these up live tomorrow, which if you're, if you're a part of our meetup page, you'll see the email that will go out promoting this. So we've got Amy, who's going to be our special guest speaker in October. And then for November, uh, we have a local investor here named Dennis McDaniel who's going to talk about his top three strategies in real estate investing on how we start, build, and scale his real estate business. And Dennis is... He, he does a little bit of everything. He's doing some wholesaling, fix and flips. Uh, his, his wife is also in the business. She is a licensed realtor in our local market as well. We were actually trying to get him on for October, but uh, he and his wife, uh, the due date for their baby is two days before our projected meetup. So we decided that it would not be a good idea to have him October. So we moved him to November. And again, this, this meetup, we will also have a sign up link for this on our meetup page as well. So tomorrow you should be able to RSVP for both of these. And I'd say RSVP to these as soon as you can, because we have a hundred people limit for our meetups uh, using zoom. So it's a first come first serve. So make sure you RSVP as soon as possible. Now, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of focus in on wholesale real estate investing. I'm going to cover a few key topics uh, through wholesale real estate investing. But before I get to that, uh, just a little bit about me. My name is Kurt Davis. Like I said before, I'm one of the founders of Real Estate Wealth Coaching. I'm originally from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I used to be a full-time hotel chef for about 11 years before I moved to Memphis back in 2007 to start investing full-time. Uh, in the time that I have been involved in real estate, I have been able to acquire a portfolio of about 31 single family homes using private money, a strategy called the Burr strategy. Uh, real estate investing has just been able to do a ton of things. And rather than me drone on about all the great things real estate has done for me, just know that you know, I, I've been there. I know where people are coming from, whether you hate your job or love your job or whether you're looking for supplemental income or long-term uh, future planning, retirement planning, whatever it may be. Uh, I know exactly what you're going through. Uh, real estate investing is such an incredible tool out there that, you know, that's one of the reasons why I enjoy doing classes like this because I really enjoy being able to give back to people and share things that uh, could hopefully help somebody at some point in time. So that's just a little bit about me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we are going to cover some wholesaling concepts tonight. Now, before I get started, um, you know, drop a note in the chat box. And let me know, uh, let us, let Jack and I know where you're at in your real estate business. Are you new? Are you, are you a beginner? Have you completed, you know, one to five deals? What are you doing? Are you doing wholesaling? Are you doing fix and flips? Do any, does anybody here own any rental property? Let us know uh, in the chat message below. We would love to know what's going on in your business. So what is wholesale real estate or wholesaling? And what is wholesaling? So this, this picture here kind of dictates in a summed up fashion what wholesaling looks like. So on the far left here, you have, this is who we refer to as the seller. Sellers come in all shapes and sizes, ages and whatnot. The person in the middle is you. The person on the right holding the money bags is your end buyer. So in terms of what wholesaling is, is you are a middleman or a middle woman coordinating a purchase and a sale between a seller and a cash buyer. Your fee is the assignment fee, which is essentially the markup. So if you lock up a home for 30000 and assign it to your cash buyer for forty, you made $10,000. That's kind of in a nutshell, what wholesaling is. And we are going to talk about a few simple concepts of how you can do this with a couple strategies with very little or maybe a little bit of money out of your pocket. It just depends on what your budget is. Now, a lot of people, when they get started in wholesaling, always ask a question. Should I get property first or do I need cash buyers first? And a lot of it depends on who you're talking to. Uh, if you have, if you can go out and find property, but you do not have any buyers to sell that home to, that's not a good position to be in. If you build a cash buyers list, 
but you do not have any property to bring to them, that bring to them yet, it's not the end of the world. So we're going to focus on how to start building your cash buyers list before you start looking for property to put under contract and wholesale. All right. So I'm going to list a couple concepts here, a couple places, ways, strategies on how you can build a cash buyers list. So depending on where you're at in the country, depend, a lot of this depends on your market as well. Uh, but you know, like I say, we're here located in Memphis. Memphis is a very hot market for uh, investors. There's a lot of turnkey companies here as well. So uh, companies in, in, in the company that I'm affiliated with uh, by Memphis now, we are an actual turnkey company. So from a company standpoint, we need properties. And there's many companies like us here as well. So a lot of people would say that companies who focus on flipping, fix and flips to, to out-of-state investors or buying and selling, reselling as their business model, some people would consider they are what would be your lowest hanging fruit because they are your best, fastest cash buyers. So depending on your market, you want to seek out these companies and talk to the person who is their acquisition manager, or acquisition specialist to learn what the criteria is they're looking for because those are the types of properties you want to target. You also want to find buy and hold investors. Now, I just said that I'm with a turnkey company, but I am also a buy and hold investor. And there are times that I may buy a property that was presented to our company that did not work for our strategy for one reason or another, but it may work for my personal strategy. So you're also looking for buy and hold investors, primarily ones that are, you know, at, from, from a wholesale standpoint, you have to have cash buyers. You cannot really work with anybody who's doing conventional financing. So buy and hold investors who can pay cash, whether it's their personal cash or they're getting private lending. Google, Google in your local market, real estate cash buyers. You'll be surprised what shows up. Now, Facebook, and, I'm, and on Facebook, I am a part of a lot of investment groups. And one of the strategies that I see a lot of wholesalers do to build their list is I see a lot of wholesalers who will go on these pages and they'll say like, like an example would be, is anybody buying in three, eight, one, two, seven or three, eight, one, one, five you know, those are a couple zip codes here in Memphis. And, uh, or, or they'll say something like I've got a property who's interested, drop your email, Re whether or not we think that this person is legit or not because of how hot the market is, everybody is dropping their email address. So get on social media, find the investment groups, the wholesale groups, the cash buyer groups in your area, and you want to be in those groups. And you can start building a cash buyers list from that group as well. You know, essentially networking with other wholesalers, you can do that as well. Uh, if you're not on bigger pockets, uh, you should be. Bigger Pockets is probably the Bigger Pockets is like Facebook for the real estate investor world. So if you're not on Bigger Pockets, you absolutely need to be. It's it's such a great great tool and a resource for investors, regardless of what kind of investing you're doing. Check it out. But when you when you get on Bigger Pockets, you can network, you can post in the forums, you can find investors in your local area, cash buyers. It's, they're all there. That's a great, great tool to check out. Depending on your local area, look into your local real estate investment club. Uh, here in Memphis, we have one called MIG, Memphis Investors Group. Uh, you can find cash buyers there. You can network with other wholesalers there. You, you will find all these people in your local investment club. Meetups, meetup groups, obviously this, uh, we advertise this meeting through our meetup group and there's a lot of people who communicate and connect through the meetup group. So that's another great place to find cash buyers. Now, I don't know how it is maybe in your market, but here in Memphis, we have a newspaper called the Memphis Daily News. And in the newspapers, they are publicly advertising all real estate transactions that happen between buyer and seller. So I can grab the daily news every single day and I can look in the real estate section under 
uh, the transactions that have been sold, and I can see who's buying what from who. And I see all the I see all the companies and things like that. So that's another great tool to utilize for cash buyers. And if you're not in the Memphis market, look into your local paper in your area as well. Now, direct mail is a way to build a cash buyers list and you know, it's going to cost you a couple bucks to do something like this. But like I mentioned, for example, uh, and there, there's a lot of different sources that you could do something like this through. You can use skip tracing services. You can like, for example, I just mentioned the, the daily newspaper for us. I can call up the daily news and, and request a list of anybody who's bought a home cash for whatever date I want. So I can essentially, I can pay for a cash buyer's list. It just depends on, you know, again, your budget and how fast and how bad you want that list. But that is a way to do it. So hopefully those are a handful of options and suggestions that you can use to start building your cash buyer's list. But if anything, this is a great place to start. Anybody have any other ideas or suggestions, anything you thought I missed for cash buyers, drop them in the chat box below and uh, maybe I'll add it to my next presentation. All right, so now that we were just talking about finding cash buyers, we now need to find sellers. And this is gonna be more of an emphasis on off-market properties. We're not really focusing on MLS, multiple listing service homes, uh, that may be listed with real estate agents. We're not really going to focus on that right now. So one of the first techniques that I learned when I moved to Memphis and got involved in real estate investing was uh, it's a strategy that we call driving for dollars. So when you're out driving for dollars, you know, you, this, these, these images here are kind of a indication of what you might see. Ideally, you're looking for the for rent signs like these one, these, these kind of homemade ones. Uh, also for sale by owner is the other sign that you're looking for. Uh, essentially the same thing, obviously the for rent person, you're going to, you're going to get directly in contact with the owner of the property. And that's why you're going to contact that one. Now these images I have here of the boarded up house, uh, you know, obviously that's a good indicator of a house that you want to try to find the owner at. The other one that I have here, you know, this is a house that, certainly needs a paint job. The landscaping's overgrown. You can tell that the house has just been neglected for some time, uh, which a person who owns a home like this statistically should be more motivated to sell. So that's why I kind of gave you these examples of types of property that you may find when you're out looking. So driving for dollars, there's really kind of two categories we're going to look at here. On the, we're gonna, I'm going to focus right now on the for sale and the for rent by owner signs. So when you're out driving around and you're going to do driving for dollars, what you really need to focus on is, is you should be driving for dollars in neighborhoods or zip codes where your cash buyers are wanting to buy property. Uh, that's kind of one of the, like I said, that's one of the reasons why I focused a little bit on uh, building a cash buyers list first because you need to know what your cash buyers want. So then you can then go out and try to find it. So once you have a handful of cash buyers and you've got the, you know, the neighborhoods or the parts of town or the zip codes where they're buying in and you know their criteria, then you venture out and you start driving for dollars. Now, when you're driving down the road and you happen to come on uh, one of these particular signs, my suggestion is, is you pull over and you take your phone out and you take a picture of the front of the house and then also zoom in and take a, take a picture of the sign that has the phone number. Make sure you've got the address as well. And then what I do is I just drive off and that's it. I'm going to get back to my computer and I'm going to look this property up online. And, you know, I put down here, if you're in Memphis, you can look up the Shelby County tax assessor website. You can look on Zillow to get some general property details. But what you're trying to do ultimately is you're trying to do a little bit of homework. You're doing a little bit of recon on this property before you actually make that call. Because you want to see online, you want, you want to see how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms it has. Um, if you can look at the right information, you're going to try to find out who the actual owner is maybe where they live. Now, granted, you've got a phone number here, so you know keep that in mind. But once you've done a little bit of homework on the property, scoped it out, 
then it's time to make a, make the call to the owner. And I put use a script. I have a slide here uh, next that I've got kind of a generic script that I'm going to go over here in a minute. But this is all I really do when I'm driving around. I see a, I, I see a sign in the yard. I pull over. I take the pictures. I get back to my computer. I start looking up the information, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I like to see if the owner is local or not. And then I get ready to make the call. Now, if you happen to come upon a home that is highly distressed or boarded up, but there's no sign in the yard, we're still going to do some of the same concepts. We're going to take a picture of that house. We're going to get the address. I'm also going to look the house up again on the tax assessor or even Zillow. But now... I don't have a phone number as of right this moment. I don't have a way to contact this person. So one thing you can do is, is typically on the Shelby County Tax Assessor website or, or whatever source you use, you want to try to track down the address of the owner. Now, if the actual address of the owner is registered to that house that you're looking at that is vacant and boarded up, that's going to be a little tough. Maybe sending a letter to that house is not the right move to do there, but Nevertheless, I'm still going to send out a letter if the address is a different location. Or if I want to try to find the phone number, you can do a reverse lookup, skip trace, and you can use a website such as truepeoplesearch.com. That's truepeoplesearch.com. Uh, you know, try that because the goal is to get the owner on the phone. And once you get that information, uh, especially if you get a phone number, you make the call using the script. So I do have a script that I have put together. That was well, let me let me put it this way: this was a script that was given to me back in 2007, and I kind of customized it to work that makes me feel comfortable when I'm talking to a seller. So uh, the text that you see in yellow are the questions that I am asking the seller. So to to kind of role play here just a little bit. When I get ready to make the call, keep, keep in mind, I've already done a little research on the home. Online, I technically know how many bedrooms and bathrooms and everything at the home. I, I have a, a basic idea of about, about the house, but I'm getting ready to call the owner so I can learn actual information. So when I make the call and they, and they answer, I'll say, hi, my name is Kurt Davis, and I noticed that you have a home for sale located at 123 Main Street, and I wanted to know if the home is still available for sale. They're going to say yes or no, but typically, if they've got a sign in the yard, yes, the home is still available. Great. Can you tell me a little bit about the home? Now, this is key here because you have some people that will wear you out on the phone. They're going to tell you everything you need to know about the house, and they're going to tell you everything that you don't need to know about the house. And then you're going to have some people who don't know how to talk. Like they're going to grunt and moan and they're going to sound like a caveman, but you need to get the information out of them. So ultimately what I'm trying to find out is, is I want to know how many bedrooms and bathrooms it is. You want to ask them about the age of the roof, the HVAC, hot water tank, just overall general condition. When, when have you made upgrades? Has there been any issues? Things like that. After you have gathered enough information about this particular property, I follow it up and I say, it sounds like you have a very nice home. Can I ask, why do you want to sell? I'm going to say that same exact thing, whether the house sounded absolutely horrible or not, because I'm trying to compliment them just a little bit. So it sounds like you have a very nice home. Can I ask you why you want to sell? Now, this is huge right here, because you want to hear why they want, why are they wanting to sell? Oh, so-and-so died and I want to move to Florida. Nana and the kids, we want to be where, whatever the reason is, you're, you're looking for signs of motivation. That's what you're looking for. You're looking to hear how motivated do they sound. That's, that's really the big key. Now, regardless of how motivated they sound, but if you can identify that they're motivated, that's, that's good for you. Then you follow it up and you say, what is your asking price or how much do you want for the home or you know, whatever subtle way you want to transition into, you basically want to ask them how much they want for the home. Now, most people will give you a price. Oh, you know, because if, if, if they have a for sale sign in the yard, they have a price in mind on how much they want for the home. So, and this is why you do some of that homework on the front end 
because you're trying to get an idea. And now if you're brand new, it may be a little bit difficult to learn how to evaluate sales comps and things like that in the neighborhood. But, uh, you know, by doing some searching online using Zillow and their mapping and, and things like that, you, you can kind of get an idea on, on how it works. But so they're going to blurt out a price. I want $75,000 for the home. Well, you have to kind of, you have to kind of know a little bit at that point is $75,000 way too much. Is that just right? Or is that a killer deal? Uh, and, de and depending on how that works for you and where you're at and if that number works, what you're ultimately trying to do then is determine if it's worth scheduling an appointment to go see that home. So if it is determined that you might have a deal here, you'll follow it up with something like, I like what I hear and I'd like to know if I could schedule a time for me to come over and take a look at the home. You're setting the appointment. So that's essentially how you get your foot in the door using a very, very generic call script. And if you have your phone or whatever and you want to do a screenshot of this, go ahead and take a screenshot of it and customize it to work for however it makes you feel comfortable. But, uh, you know, like I said, one of the reasons why people, uh, believe it or not, a call script for some people is, is a massive lifesaver. A lot of people do not like talking on the phone and some people are very good at it. Some people, they are completely afraid to death. I don't know if I'm good on the phone or not. The very first job I ever had when I was 15, I worked for a, a, a phone survey company where I was 15 years old and I'm calling people all around the country trying to see if I could get them to let me survey them. So I don't know. It doesn't bother me being on the phone at all. But the, you know, again, like I said, this is a very generic platform here. Copy it, customize it to how it works for you. Ultimately, you're trying to find out if it's a deal so you can get your foot in the door. Now, this is kind of a continued talking to the seller because, yes, we were just talking to the seller with the generic call script, but I got a few other key catchphrases, if that's what you want to call them, uh, when you're talking to these people because one of, the, one of the biggest hurdles for some people who are new to real estate investing when you talk to these sellers, essentially, like we said, when you're wholesaling, you are trying to find out if you can put their home under contract so that you can then assign that contract to a cash buyer. Some people have an issue if they know that they actually do not have the money to buy that house because ultimately what you're trying to find out with these people is, is how much will they take? And in a lot of cases, you're presenting yourself like you are the actual cash buyer for the home. But in wholesaling, you are not the actual cash buyer. You're the middle person, but you're not, but a lot of times you're not trying to come off like a middle person. So there's, 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 there's a lot of dynamics that are going on right here. So I have a few paragraphs or sentences here that I'm going to show you here in a second that I feel like you can use that will really take that pressure off when you're dealing with sellers uh, to alleviate that so that you feel very confident when you're talking with them. So I kind of reserve this for when I'm actually at the home with the seller. Because after you've, after you've arrived on the property and the sellers let you in and you're walking around and you're looking at the house and you're, and you're taking notes and, and things like that and you're, you're listening to them tell you everything that they already told you on the phone again for the second time, at some point in time, you're going to get to a point where you're, you're trying to negotiate. You're trying to lock this deal in, okay? So what I would say to, number one, not necessarily lead them on uh, is, is this, and I'm going to read this here. So, you know, take a picture of it if you'd like. But at some point in time in the conversation at the property with the seller, you're going to say, I work with a large network of cash buyers located all over the country. And I would like the opportunity to present your home to them for the next X amount of days, whether you're trying to get seven days, 10 days, 30 days, the more the merrier for you, but I just put 30 days. So I would like the opportunity to present your home to them for the next 30 days. What is your best price? If I can bring an all cash buyer 
who will buy the home in as-is condition and pay all of your closing costs. And then you wait. You be quiet. You're waiting to hear what they're going to say. Because on the phone, they told you 75 grand. And that was enough for you to want to schedule this appointment. So now you're showing up here and you say this. They may not change their price at all. It still may be 75 grand. But if they come off that, fantastic. Now, you should have done a little bit of research to try to identify where you need to be for that property. So if they say 75,000 and that doesn't work and it's really a little bit lower, you might want to try to negotiate a little bit with them. So once I hear what their price is, and we may or may not have a deal at this point, when you're, when you're, when you're trying to lock this property up, you're going to follow it up with this line. You're going to say, if for some reason I can't bring you an all cash buyer, we can either part ways as friends or we can maybe look at lowering the price. So what you have really done here in this, you know, with what I've, what I've said here is you have essentially told the seller that you are not the actual cash buyer, but you're trying to, and you want to try to help them sell their property, but you're still going to bring a contract with for them to sign. Does that make sense? So, I feel like if you can use, use these sentences or paragraphs right here when you're talking to the seller in the home, it will really take all that stress away because you're not, you're not leading them on. What happens a lot of times is, is, new, is new wholesalers will put homes under contract. They'll have no idea what they're doing and whether it's actually a good price or not. And then they will lead the homeowner on to think that they're going to they're the one who's going to buy the property and then when that wholesaler cannot find a cash buyer because all the cash buyers that they presented the house to told them it was way too much next thing you know they stop answering their phone and they turn into a ghost and now the home the homeowner is very upset and it might ruin it for maybe the next wholesaler who comes along who maybe could perform or, or knew how to approach the scenario so this right here will really take a lot of that pressure off. Any questions so far, anybody? If you do, unmute yourself and I'll try and answer it real quick. Anybody? No? All right, we'll keep going. Okay, so to give you a, I put, I put together a case study here of an actual driving for dollars property that I did a few years ago. And this picture of the home is the actual home. Uh, this house is located in Memphis, Tennessee. It's in the Parkway Village area of Memphis, zip code 38118, on a street called Navajo, Navajo, however you want to pronounce that. So this particular home, I was act the, and I remember when this happened. It, it seems like yesterday, but it's really been a few years ago. I was Perfect leaving meditation. the house on the same street that we were renovating, and I was driving down the street, and I happened to look over, and I saw the red and white for sale by owner sign. I pulled, you know, now because I've done this before, uh, you know, I had the confidence to know what homes, basically I knew what I should buy the home for in the area. I knew what I'd resell it for, things like that. So I felt confident enough to just make the call right then and there. So I called the number, a really nice lady answered the phone and, and I kind of went into my pitch like I did. And when I, when I asked her how much she wanted for the home, she said $55,000. And I knew that that was just a little bit too much. So I initially told her that I'd have to be in it for 30 grand. And of course, that was not going to work. And I, and I think one of the key reasons why I was able to make this deal work is that rather than try to prove to her why my offer was fair and things like that, all I said was, if anything changes, give me a call back. Here's my number. And that was it. So about 30 days later, I get a phone call from her again. And she wanted to know if I'd be able to meet her at the house to look at it. Well, what I didn't know the first time I called her is, is she had somebody else that she was talking to where she thought she was going to get 50 grand for the house. That turned out to not be the case. So we met at the house and, you know, I initially offered 30 
thousand. After checking it out, we were able to negotiate a price, an all cash price of thirty three thousand. Now, because we're a turnkey company, our normal business model would have been to close on this home with cash, fix it up, put a renter in place, advertise it out to our cash buyers. But we had it. We had one of our client. We had a cash buyer repeat client in place already. So once we locked this house up for thirty three grand, we assigned it to our cash buyer for fifty eight grand. And of that, seventy five hundred uh, repairs were included in that fifty eight thousand. So within the next seven to ten days, when we essentially assigned our contract to our cash buyer, we walked away with a net profit of about seventeen five. So this is a real example. This is not made up, uh, and, and these types of deals are out there. Uh, and you got to understand that as a wholesaler. Uh, you may you may make as little as five hundred to a thousand dollars on a deal. You may make upwards of, uh, you know, twenty grand. Which in in wholesaling world, at least in our market, I'd consider twenty thousand a home run. I purchased a house in a in an upper class area in our market here that I purchased as a buy and hold investor. And when I was at the closing table, I asked the closing attorney, "How much is this wholesaler making on this particular deal?" And when they when they looked at me and paused, I knew that it was an insane amount. And she told me that the wholesaler was making a sixty five thousand dollar wholesale profit, and that was off a deal that I bought. So I don't know if I didn't negotiate right or what, but uh, good for them for making sixty five grand, and good for me because I, I got the deal that I wanted. So in the did end, it all works deals? out. Uh, did, did I hear somebody have a question? Yeah, on that deal, did you have to do a double close? On which one? The one when he made sixty five thousand. Uh, you know they uh, they did not do a double close, and you know one one at the same time they they didn't do the paperwork correctly like you normally would do an assignment because when you present an assignment when as a wholesaler when you put a home under contract with a seller. And then you use the assignment contract with your cash buyer. Typically on the assignment contract, it spells out, you know, how much your assignment fee is and everything like that. Well, when these guys sent me the contract, they didn't really send it over that way. And I don't know if they were doing that on purpose or not, but I had a choice to make at the closing table. I could have said, no, I'm going to cancel this deal. Uh, or I could have called them up on the phone right there and said, you guys are out of your mind. I'm not going to let you make 65 grand. I'll let you make 30 grand. And they may or may not have done that. But what that would have done is, is that would have taken me off their list forever. And they could have told other people about that, which could have taken me off a lot of lists. So at the end of the day, I did the right thing, which is I bought the house for the property that I, or for the price that I agreed to. And, and I will tell you, just to tell you a little bit more, I did ask them on, I did ask them on the phone later. I said, what would you have done? You know, cause we were joking, like, you know, congratulations, you made, you know, 65 grand. They're like, Oh, we owe you a steak dinner. But I, I, I asked them point blank. I said, what would you have done if I would have told you that I was not going to pay that? What if I would have said, I will only, you know, we need to knock it off by 20 grand. And they told me that they would have done that because they did not have the funds to close on the deal. And it was closing day. So sure, I could have got a $20,000 discount if I wanted to try, but I didn't know that at the time, but still that's, it's, it's not the right ethical thing to do. So, um, hope that kind of answers your question. They did not double close. Anybody else have a question real quick? All right. All right. So I've spent some time talking about the driving for dollars technique. And one of the reasons why driving for dollars is, is a great place for wholesalers to get started is, is that it really doesn't cost anything except for some time and, and gas. And that's really about it. So the next thing that we're going to move forward on is direct mail advertising. This is probably from a paid marketing standpoint, this is probably the most popular way uh, when someone is wholesaling that they will do next to try to attract sellers. 
because even though it does cost money and obviously, you know, the sky's the limit with this kind of stuff, it's still a lower cost option than a lot of some of the other, what you may call more advanced techniques, which I'll probably do at some point in time on, on a meetup, but things like uh, cold calling, maybe using virtual assistants, uh, doing ringless voice messaging and the ever popular uh, text message servicing, those types of things. So uh, direct mail is kind of like the second thing that you do. And, and a lot, and a lot of wholesalers will really kind of do driving for dollars and direct mail uh, at the same time with each other. So uh, these pictures that you see here are kind of like a standard of what, direct mail in a lot of cases will look like. I will tell you that most people will use uh, postcards as opposed to actually sending letters. And a lot of it really just comes down to it, it, it's far cheaper to send out postcards than it is actual letters. And uh, before I move on to the next slide where I talk a little bit more about this, uh, one thing that I do with my direct mail, and I will tell you, I still do direct mail to this day. I just sent out a direct mail campaign yesterday uh, for our local area. Um, a lot of people always ask me, what phone number should I put on my marketing? Some people wonder, should they put their personal cell phone on there or not? Or should I create a, like a Google phone number, things like that? I do it just maybe, I don't want to say I do it differently, but I feel like I do what a lot of other people who are doing this maybe on a larger scale do um, for people who are doing lots of different types of marketing and advertising. It's very important for us to know where our leads come from. So I use a service called call rail and you can check it out. It's callrail.com. And what it is is it's a service that it gives you phone numbers for your local area, but then it also you, you can you can dictate what's going to happen with that phone number because I'm not going to put my personal cell phone number on my direct marketing pieces. I don't want any of these people to actually have my phone number. So this service gives me numbers and then I assign those numbers to say, you know, for like direct marketing or whatever. And then I also have it so that when these people call on my marketing pieces, and, and, and again, you know, this is my personal preference. Uh, some people want to have it so that if somebody calls the number off my postcard, they want to answer it live, and that's fantastic. But I'll tell you what happens if you're busy or what happens if you see a number come in. You know, I, I've got a 605 area code phone number, and that's from South Dakota. I've lived in Memphis for 13, 14 years. I can't tell you how many people don't answer my 605 number but then when I call them right after that with my Google local number, they answer because so, everyone's, everyone's worried about spam. So when these people call my numbers that I have through CallRail, I, I've already got pre-recorded uh, voice messaging that they will hear. And the great thing about it is, is this service will, if somebody calls and they, and they hang up or they don't let the voice message finish or even leave a message, the CallRail service still tracks all of that. And I can call these people. And in a lot of cases, it gives me their name uh, as well. So I know who called me. So it's just a great way to track your marketing leads so that you don't actually answer them. Because, you know, what if they call you in the middle of dinner and you don't want to answer? Or if you do answer and you've got a mouthful of food, you know, I mean, it's just a lot of things can be happening. So I don't recommend putting your actual phone number on the marketing piece have it for have a forwarding number that rings directly into a voice message. That's my opinion. Anyway, so again, you see these marketing pieces here. One of the most popular uh, direct mail companies out there is it's called yellowletterscomplete.com. Now keep in mind there are endless direct mail companies out there, but this is just one of the more popular ones. I think kind of partially because they've been around a little bit longer than a lot of the other ones uh, and they've got a heavy emphasis on real estate investing. So you can go on yellow, you can go to yellow letters complete and you can look at the postcards and they will range anywhere. Again, depending on size and everything that, that it can come with, you can get them as cheap as 40 cents per, per card, anywhere up to a dollar and 34, a lot of, based on the size. Also the larger quantity that you order, the cheaper it is. 
letters are obviously naturally going to be more expensive because now you've got envelopes and letters are just larger in general. Um, the other thing that you have to do when you do a direct mail marketing campaign through a service like this is that, you know, you, that's great that you're picking out your postcards and the design, but you also have to pay for the leads. So what do I mean by that? So if you look right below here, I've got 20 cents per lead. That's what yellow letters complete charges per lead. So uh, the, you can look at absentee owners, people who are out of state, high equity, divorce, inherited properties. You can get people who are late 30, 60, 90 days on their mortgages. There's lots of different criteria they can look up, but it's 20 cents per lead. So if you're going to do a, I think, uh, I mean, just to give you some numbers, I sent out a roughly 2000 uh, postcard campaign yesterday and with my postcards and the leads and taxes and fees and everything like that, it was roughly about 1300 bucks. So I paid $1,300 to send this out to 2000 leads based on the specific criteria that I plugged in. Uh, they also have a great service that you can do for people who want to market to the same exact lead list. So they have a drip campaign program. And it's kind of cool. You can check it out on their website. But what it is, is it says it sends different types of targeted marketing pieces to the same exact list over a specific period of time to really focus in on that. Because some people will say, isn't direct mail marketing just completely saturated? Now, I own 30 some single family homes. And I will tell you that I get postcards in the mail at my house all the time. And sure, I look at them, but I mean, am I going to call them? No. Actually, to tell you the truth, I call them because I want them to send me houses when they get them under contract. So, uh, but, you know, there is no right or wrong way in terms of if I'm going to do a direct mail marketing campaign, do I do something like a drip campaign to the same list four or five different times over a period of time? Or do you constantly change zip codes and criteria every time you do it? it you know, you're rolling the dice. It, 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 you know, it could work. It could not work uh, either way. Uh, I think your odds are just as good whether you're doing it one way or the other. But the biggest key for direct mail is you have to be consistent. You cannot just send out one or two direct mail campaigns. And if you don't get the results that you're looking for, all of a sudden you just quit. Uh, really what I would say is you need to look at your budget and you need to determine what you can afford. How much can you, how much can you afford for direct mail marketing? If you're going to do it, whatever that dollar amount is, you know, hopefully it's enough that can get you at least three months into your direct mail marketing. So one of the things that we and I will do when we're doing our direct mail is ideally you need to send out a minimum campaign once per month. Ideally, two times per month, if you can. Now, my strategy, what I do is I will send it out to different zip codes, different, I, I, may, I may send it out to the same type of list. So like, for example, if I'm going to send it to absentee owners, I may send it to absentee owners, but I'll do that in several different zip codes. And then once I've kind of made the rounds through the areas I want, and depending on the type of response I've gotten, I'll go back and fine tune that again. Uh, so really the key is to be consistent. Who's got a question? Yeah. So on your direct mail postcards, when you get them back, do you do, do you dig in deeper if they come back uh, from the post office back to your address to see why they didn't get them? Or do you uh, just mark that as dead? I just mark it. I'll be honest with you. I just mark it as dead. I mean, that, that, that's just going to require too much effort to, to figure out why they were returned. And I will tell you that that is something that has happened for us as well. Uh, I don't think it's any fault on the, like, for example, if I, if I got returned mail, I don't look at yellow letters and go, Oh, you guys have a terrible list or what's wrong. I mean, they're pulling the same data like a lot of these other companies will. The only other thing that I could tell you to do, and it still doesn't guarantee is, is that in this example, you're having to pay for the leads through yellow letters complete you can also go out and get your own list so for example there's web there's lots of websites out there but one of the more popular ones is called list source you may be able to find a 
even more detailed type of list from another list service. Uh, maybe you might find the leads cheaper per lead somewhere else. Uh, and you can bring it. I've done things in the past before where uh, I've gone to a website called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. And I've bought a list of 10,000 skip trace leads and it cost me about a thousand bucks. Now, price wise, that's not too bad, but it's hard to gauge the quality of that list as well. So um, you can import your own list into Yellow Letters Complete. So just make that known. But no, I, I, I don't. I don't try to figure out why I'm getting returned return numbers. I just call it a loss and keep moving on. Anybody else? If anybody who's on tonight has used some form of direct mail marketing campaign. Drop a note in the chat and let us know what you used. If you're, if you're willing to share, let us know if it worked, how long you did it. Let us know any details. We'd love to hear what you're doing. All right. Now, I'm kind of, this, this next slide obviously is titled Cash Buyer Email Formula. What this ultimately means is, is that now someone like myself who buys homes to fix and flip, I am on lists of lots of wholesalers. So I, I get houses sent to me constantly. And some wholesalers will send me an email that has all the right information that I'm looking for that makes it easy for me to look at a property and determine if this is basically what they're doing is they're making my job easy to determine if I'm even interested in this property or not. On the flip side, I'll get emails from wholesalers that sometimes they won't even have the address of the home. I'll just get an email that'll have five blurry photos and it'll say, how much can you pay for this? And it's like, wow, there's so much information that you did not include in the email. How do I even take this seriously? So as someone who is always looking to buy homes, I'm going to kind of give you what I call the cash buyer email formula. And this is essentially going to be things that you as a wholesaler, when you're trying to present properties to your cash buyers, this is how you should present it. Now, I'm not going to be showing you cool logos or anything like that. I'm just going to be essentially give you the data on what needs to be included. So these are the things that I consider that need to be required when you send over. So when you, so when I get an email from a wholesaler, I need to be able to see the address of the home. I'm looking for some basic property information, bedrooms, bathrooms, square footage, things like that. It's very important to know what the asking price is from the wholesaler. Uh, I need them to send me the photos, preferably in a link. So if, so if you do not have, say, like a Dropbox account, go ahead and sign up for Dropbox. Uh, and when you're, when you're locking up property, you, need, you should take a minimum of 30 to 50 photos of this house. You need to be very, very detailed. Um, it's not just enough to shoot some random photos, you know, where you're standing in the middle of the street and I can't tell what the real condition is of the siding or the softened fascia. I need good photos, front, back, side to side, every bedroom, every bathroom, uh, kitchen, living room, hallway, air conditioner, furnace, hot water tank. Take pictures of the problems that stick out. Those are the things I'm looking at. Uh, if the house is occupied, is it occupied by the actual homeowner or is it occupied by a renter? And if the house is rented out, I need to know what the actual rental amount is, if it's, if it's managed by a property manager or not, and when does their lease expire? Because, uh, you know, depending on who your, you know, who your cash buyer is, they may not, for, for example, some people I know, they will not buy a home if it's rented out or not, and they don't care. House has to be vacant. So these are just a lot of important things to know. And then maybe just a general detail description of the home kind of like share your thoughts on the property when you were there walking through because, because when you're wholesaling, you're, you know, you're not trying to waste your cash buyer's time and your cash buyers are not trying to waste your time. So it's really important to send as much of this information as possible because ultimately it builds credibility with your cash buyers. 
if every email I get from you when you're trying to advertise a home has this information, it, it's, it's going to tell me that you're doing the right steps. If all you're including is three blurry photos and hardly any information, I'm not going to take you seriously. Now, some additional things that you could include if you wanted to, but not necessarily required, are things like rental comps, sales comps, rehab estimate, taxes, your idea of what cash flow and return on investment look like, appreciation. And the reason why I say you don't need to put that stuff in there is, is that the cash buyers who are going to be buying this home they're going to, they're going to know all that anyway. They're going to have their, they're going to look the house up to determine what they think it'll rent for, what they'll be able to sell it for. If you provide 30 to 50 photos, they're going to have a really good idea of what the rehab estimate should be. They're going to be able to look up the taxes. They're going to run the, their own cash flow and return on investment pro forma based on their sales criteria on what their clients are looking for. So it's great if you want to try to learn how to figure out and do all that, but your cash buyers don't necessarily need that. They need everything essentially in the required column. Anybody have any questions so far? Someone's got to have a question. <laughs> so, so like I said, we've covered, we've covered driving for dollars, direct mail, how to build cash buyers list, how to find sellers and how to present the property to your cash buyers. So again, like I said, this is for, for some of you who are on the call tonight, this may be super basic and you're having a hard time staying awake, but maybe for some of you or a lot of you who are maybe just new or getting started in real estate investing and wholesaling is a strategy, uh, hopefully that this information is kind of fine tuned a little bit on these strategies because I will tell you that these strategies do work and it's really all about consistency. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention and I, and I forgot to mention it when I was talking about the whole driving for dollars is, is that there is a, there's a website or an app and it's called deal machine. I believe it's called deal machine and it's kind of, you know, there's a, I think there's a monthly fee that you pay to be a member, but it tracks your, it tracks your, essentially when you turn the app on and you start driving for dollars on a map, it keeps track of where you've been. So you do not overlap. And if you pull up in front of houses, there's a way that you can look that it, it, essentially the, the app will skip trace the owner for you. And with a few push of the buttons, you can send out your own direct mail marketing piece to that owner right there sitting in your car. Now, of course, all that stuff because of how super convenient and cool that kind of stuff is, there's obviously a cost associated for all that, but check it out for anybody who's doing uh, driving for dollars. Um, like I said, I kind of do it old school by looking it up and maybe doing true people search and things like that. But deal machine is a very cool, cool product. So um, for everybody who's been in this call tonight, you know, whether you're new or, you know, just getting started or whether you've maybe completed just a few deals um, we're offering to do no hassle, no obligation discovery calls with anybody who would like to jump on a call with me, either myself or Jack. All you have to do is go to realestatewealthcoaching.com backslash consultation and go ahead and schedule a call and we will do our best to steer you in the right direction, whether mentoring is an option for you or whether you just need to fine tune a a strategy or you have a few basic questions about uh, real estate in general and maybe how to point you in the right direction, just go ahead and schedule the call. Uh, we're not going to ask for your credit card information. We're not going to try to twist your arm into anything. Uh, so uh, it's just a great way for us to connect with you. And